Welcome to this fifth engaged high level lecture which focuses on Latin America and the European Union interregional relations in the context of global geopolitical rivalry. My name is Andrea Bianculli. I am a professor and researcher at the Institut Barcelona de Estudis Internacionals and I am also the coordinator of the Masters in International Relations there. First, I would like to mention that ENGAGE is a Horizon 2020 project that looks into how the EU can effectively and sustainably meet strategic challenges by employing all of its tools of external action and by consequence become a more assertive global actor. To do so, ENGAGE brings together 13 academic institutions and think tanks from across Europe. You can know more about ENGAGE by checking its website, that is engage-eu.eu. And you can also subscribe to its letter, newsletter. Now to today's topic. It is said that the European Union and its member states have long neglected the establishment of deeper and comprehensive relations with Latin America. The regions have not been a priority for the European Union, despite a rhetoric of alignment of values and multilateral cooperation. The current competition at the global stage, notably between the United States and China, means that the EU is not alone in trying to engage or re-engage with Latin American countries and their regional blocs. The most recent EU Select Summit between the EU and the Community of Latin America and Caribbean States in July this year was an achievement in itself, but to some extent it fell short of expectations of a renewed bi-regional partnership with both initiatives. And to talk about this, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Jose Briseño Ruiz, Jose Briseño is Associate Professor at the Latin American and Caribbean Research Center of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He holds a PhD in political science and his areas of expertise include the study of regional integration in Latin America, political economy and development in the region, and Latin America's external relations, including with the European Union. Professor Briseño will speak for around 30 minutes and his talk will be followed by a Q&A with the audience. You can ask written questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, I would like to hand it over to Jose for his presentation. Thank you, Jose. Thank you so much, Andrea. Please, thank you very much, uh, Engage and Gustavo, for inviting me to be here talking about I want to see this like a conversation with you about the situation of the relation between the European Union and Latin America, and particularly the current state of this uh, relation, considering the rise of China as an economic and investment partner for many Latin American countries. I mean, what are the consequences? The implications of this rise of China in Latin America, in particular, the extent to which this Chinese rising will impact in the relation with the European Union. Uh, next, please, Gustavo. And I want to introduce my presentation, taking into account that we have, that I have just 25 minutes, uh, 35 minutes, with the situation of the relations in between Latin America and the European Union in the last three decades. And that relation has to be understood in the context of what, what has been known as the Atlantic Triangle in which the United States of America was the other part of the region. And the extent to which this articulation, this interaction between the uh, United States, Europe, and Latin America uh, shaped the interregional relations since the 1990s, or I would say the 1980s, because certainly, as Andrea has said in his present, in her presentation, uh, the European Union and Latin America is not a priority for the European Union. That is, I, I think is a fact. But one thing is that European Union, the Latin America is not is not a priority for the European Union, and a quite different thing is to say that. Latin America doesn't matter for the EU. It's different. I think 
since the 1980s, Latin America has been on the target, has been on the radar of the European Union. In the 1980s, particularly in relation to the uh, San Jose process and the Central American crisis. The Central American crisis, uh, I would normally say that one of the last fields of the Cold War was Central America, when a revolution took place in Nicaragua and civil wars uh, exploded in Salvador, in Guatemala, Honduras became also a, a military base of the United States. And there was actually a rix, a real rix of a U.S. intervention. At that moment, the president of the United States was Ronald Reagan, of the United States in Central America, a military intervention. Uh, and that was just a manifestation of the US, traditional U.S. hegemony in, in, in the continent, as presses in Pan-Americanism, the organizations of the American state, etc. Um, there was an attempt of some Latin American countries, Central American countries at the beginning, to find a peaceful solution to the crisis. And one of the crucial allies in this process of finding a, a, peace, a, a peaceful solution in the, to the crisis was the European Union, because the European Union met, was a meeting in San Jose, the capital of Costa Rica, between the Central American countries, the Contador countries, and the Central American countries to find a peaceful solution. And eventually, there, were, there was not an American intervention in, in Central, uh, U.S. intervention in Central America. Well, this is a long process that concluded with the Esquipula process promoted by the Central American then Salves. This is one of the first things we have to remember. In the 1980s, the European Union was a crucial actor in the peaceful solution in the crisis in the Central America. But certainly, it was in the 1990s when the European Union relaunched the bilater bilateral relation with Latin America. And I think, and I, well, I wrote about that 20 years ago, but another colleague also wrote about that. The uh, increasing presence of the, the United States in the Latin American economy, and particularly the project of creating a free trade area of the Americas, was a variable was a variable important in the relaunch of the European Union strategy to Latin America. Of course, it was the, not the unique variable. After the Treaty of Maastricht and the Treaty of Lisbon, there was an increasing commitment in the EU to try to find some kind of coordination of this uh, is external action, not only with Latin America, but also with other regions in the Global South, and even in, with the developed world. So we must also understand that new interest that the EU has in the 1990s in Latin America in the context of this new uh, moment that the European experience was living, this new deep, deep moment of deepening for the European integration. But certainly, at the same time, we cannot deny that the free trade area of the America that failed in, like, in 2005, but and in the 19, in the 1990s seems to be one a serious pro, pro, project that would create a free trade area from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego with a special uh, mechanism that would be advantage to the American U.S. investors and the, to the, the U.S. trade with Latin America. That was certainly an incentive, an incentive that led the Europeans to react and create a new strategy. And this strategy basically consists in the promotion of strategic association agreements. Firstly, and there were negotiations. First, the presentation of white papers, the explaining the argument why the association strategy agreement should be promoted, because the strategic association agreement related to uh, trade investment and to deal with globalization, but, but also there was a, a political commitment, political agreement in the association agreements that aim to promote democracy and human rights. And that's what very important at that moment for the Latin American countries that were experiencing a process of transition and consolidation to democracy after two decades of horrible dictatorships in the 1960s and the 1970s. 
And finally, the association agreements included the mechanisms of cooperation, the cooperation for development between the European Union. So it was a very comprehensive strategy that included trade, political cooperation, and cooperation for development. The other mechanism was the creation of the bilateral summit, the EU Latin American summit, the federal, which was held in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil in 1999, and where after summits in Madrid, in Vienna, in Monterrey, uh, in Lima, I remember. And in 2014, the EU Latin American summit became the EU CELAT summit. And finally, I am on the bilateral basis, the EU promoted the strategic partnerships with all Latin American countries, specifically with Brazil, with Mexico, and with Chile. So this was the uh, overall strategy that certainly I think um, gave to the EU an increasing protagonism in the uh, Latin American uh, international politics. Uh, a free trade agreement, an strategic agreement were signed with Central America, bilateral strategic agreement were signed with Chile and Mexico, with Chile in 2002, and with uh, and Mexico in and Chile in 2001, and Chile and with Mexico in 2002. And there was a negotiation a uh, region to region with Central America, with the Central American Integration System, known in, uh, in Spanish as SICA. Um, similarly, the European Union uh, started a very complex negotiation with Indian community countries. It was a region that in the early 2000s was experiencing that process of dynamic political change with this rise of power in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, Hugo Morales, Evo Morales in Ecuador, Rafael Correa, uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, and all that made the negotiation with Euro difficult because this left wing government criticized or rejected some of the premises, especially in the promotion of free promotion of free trade and regulation that were implicit in the trade dim dimension of the association agreements. But eventually a free trade agreement was signed with Colombia and Peru. And later Ecuador decided to start a negotiation. And probably the most known and famous case and most complicated of all of these negotiations was the negotiation with Mercosur that started in 1999. After 20 years, in 2019, it ended and finished it. But now we don't know what's going to happen with, with this agreement because there are problems, there are criticism to the agreement, both in the Mercosur countries, especially after the arrival to power in Argentina of Alberto Fernandez and Lula in Brazil, but also in the European Union, because there are concerns about human rights, democracy, and especially climate change, the commitment to climate change of some of Mercosur countries, especially Brazil during the Bolsonaro era. So as we see, uh, in terms of the uh, as strategic agreement, there was a success in relative terms, because the problem at the end of the day was the negotiation with Mercosur. And I, Honestly, I understand that because it was the most complex negotiation in the sense that in Mercosur, the two, of the, the, two, two members of the of Mercosur are among the most industrialized countries in, in Latin America with very sensitive sectors that made the negotiation with the EU much, much complex than the negotiation, for example, with Central America. I have to say that the European Union also was an ally of the Latin American young democracy in the, in the 1990s and in the 1980s. I'm not saying obviously that democratization in Latin America is the result of European intervention. This is obviously not the case. It's the result of the domestic process that Latin America experienced from Mexico to Argentina and Chile because democratization took place in different levels in Mexico that's stopped being controlled by a unique single party, the PRI, or in Argentina and Chile that uh, experienced a transition from the military, military uh, dictatorship to, to democracy. But the European Union has external force, has, not, has an external actor health to that consolidation 
in his narrative of promotion of the values of human rights, of the values of, the, of, of, of democracy, the Western democracy values that were shared traditionally with Latin American countries. So I would say it was a success also. But the, the relation, this early years of success start a process of stagnation, I would say, in in the first decade of the new of the new millennium, 2010 onwards. Uh, obviously, the difficulty of the agreement with the community, obviously, the fact that the free tree area of the Americas stopped being a, a threat and the possibility of the market from Alaska to Chile, in which the EU will be potentially excluded as a menace, as a threat, stop uh, being a concern for the European bureaucracy. The fact that the new left-wing government were you know, actually very uh, committed to promote North-South agreements. They prefer South-South agreements, agreement between Latin American countries among themselves of mechanisms of dialogue with the African or the Arab countries, and especially because of the rise of China. And this is my second point next please <clears throat> next slide please thank you uh, well the next please next next please thank you china has become a real player in latin america and the question is to what extent this rise in china is a threat for the european union and for the united states but the case of the united states is different be because of the proximity of the United States to many Latin American countries, and especially to Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean Basin, where the U.S. has uh, an absolutely importance in terms of the connections in the productions between, for example, the United States and Mexico, or Central America and, Mex Mex and Mexico in the production of cars or textile, for example. These are uh, Chains of, chains of value of value has been constructed and built for years. And so the interconnection and the relation between the European Union and Mexico, between the United States and Mexico and Central America, is very, very consolidated. This is the reason why the Chinese participation in these countries is minor compared to South America. Uh, for the European Union, it's not exactly the same. Mexico is very far from. So they... It's not that easy for the EU to deal. It's, it's, it's not the same level of complexity in dealing with the, the, the rise in China. Uh, you see in this map the situation in 2012. In 2000, sorry. In 2000. In 2000, China was the principal, the main trade partner for most of the Latin American countries, from Mexico to Chile. The exception were in Mercosur and after at the consequence of Mercosur in Argentina, the Brazil was the moment the main partner, and in or for Paraguay and Uruguay that Argentina was the main trade partner. But in general terms, in general terms in 2000, you see the map in blue. That means the expansion, the, the predominance of the United States. 20 years later, in 2020, three years ago, the, the math has changed dramatically, dramatically. The United States still is the main trend partner in, in Central America and Mexico, but in South America, China is increasingly um, controlling the trade, not investment actually, but the trade with Latin America. And this is important. Because for decades, the second trade partner to the United States in, 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 in Latin America was the European Union. For countries like Argentina, for countries like Brazil, for example, the are um, for Chile, the are uh, <clears throat> global traders, the European Union was traditionally the, the second trade partner. And now, as China has become the first, trade partner and the United States, the second trade partner, the EU has been displaced to a fair like a social trade partner in with the Latin American countries. This is not a case of investment. It's quite particular and quite interesting that 
in terms of investment, the EU is still the more important investor, external investor in Latin America. But we are uh, now listening, observing, and this is huge participation of Chinese investment in infrastructure, for example, in many Latin American countries. How so? We have to see how will be the situation in terms of investment in five years, for example. Next, please. This is the map. This is the map. I think it's from 2021, and you see more clearly the different the, 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 the divisions of Latin America. Mexico, but you see here a change. It's quite important. You see Panama now as the main trade partner of, 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 of in China being the, 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 the main trade partner for Panama. You see, even countries like Colombia that traditionally has uh, has been has been a political and economic ally of the United States. This light blue is means that is leaning to China. It's still the main trade partner of the United States, but Colombia is leaning to China, as Nicaragua is also leaning to China. So China is in Latin America. The presence of China in Latin America is quite clear. Next, please. And this is an example, a clear example of, of this. How this graphic I seen is why this practice of what has grown on in Latin America in the last 20 years. You see the levels of the trade in terms of sport or import the Latin America, export of America to China, or export the Latin America to the China to Latin America. I mean Latin American import. And you see that for less than 20 million is in the last year of this graph. 2017 uh, rise to more than 120 million million dollars. This is clear, a clear example of how China has not gradually, but in a very fast way, took place uh, two positions in the Latin American economies. It's not it's, it's not a minor actor in Latin America. Anymore, it is a crucial factor, factor in Latin America anymore, and also in terms of political and cultural trend, the, the uh, and cultural terms, the EU has also tried, the China has also tried to promote an a strategy to have an increasing visibility in the region. Next, please. One important issue, and I think to some extent a response to the EU is that the Chinese are trying to build, to construct a network of free trade agreements. And that has been no easy for the Chinese. It has been no easy because there is a fear of you know, subscribing free trade agreements with China because of the asymmetry and because the, 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 the increasing um, center periphery pattern of trade between China and the Latin American countries. Actually, the Chinese proposed in 2012 a free trade agreement with Mercosur. And the immediate response in Mercosur was no, thank you. No, for the moment. I mean, there, there is a complexity in this relation. Despite of that limitation, the, the Chinese has free trade agreement signed and, nego or, and negotiated with Chile and Peru, the pioneers in these agreements, with Costa Rica and, recent, and recently with Ecuador. And there are also discussions of possible trade negotiations with Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama. In the case, in the case of Uruguay, the situation was different. And President Lacalle, he made the decision to start the exploration of the possibility of a negotiation of a free trade agreement, many conditionals in this sentence, but it was like that, to establish a trade agreement with, between Uruguay and, and China. And that was quite problematic because according to the Mercosur rules, Uruguay has not the right to negotiate unilaterally, unilaterally with any country in the world, but Uruguay decided to go along. 
that eventually the Chinese, especially after Lula, the right to power, this year the Chinese decided to stop these most possible negotiations. And there is another factor important that, that has to be considered. The Chinese money, the Chinese currency, the yuan, has been also used in Argentina, in Bolivia, and in Brazil. It actually, in for Argentina, the Chinese has tried to help of the, the President Fernandez in a moment in which the international credit is what closed, for example. Next, please. <clears throat> also, I think more like a, um, symbolic than realistic uh, fact, uh, the Chinese has invited some Latin American countries to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative. And in the Asian <clears throat> Development Bank, uh, and, and you see that in 2020, the participation of the uh, Latin America in the Bella Road Initiative, I wouldn't say it was a little bit limited. There was not important economy in the region. But in 2022, Argentina was part of the Bella Road Initiative. So all this shows that China, the China, is an actor, and that the importance of China is increasing. And the question is, is to what extent have, this has implications for, for Europe? But before I go into that point, the next one, please. The, as I as I said, China is also promoting soft power and a soft power strategy. Let me be clear, China, the Chinese are not trying to replace the United States as the hegemonic power in the America, because that will have uh, consequences that probably the Chinese don't want to happen. That would imply a real co coherent reaction of the United States. The United States think that the America is a still a safe territory for the hegemony. They have control of the security of the hemisphere through the organization of the American state. And many countries that are making you know, business with China at the same time that are political allies for the United States. So the hegemony of the United States is not at risk. The, the, the European Union, the case probably is different but we're working, because we are not talking about the, the, you have no hegemony in, in the American continent as an important place and, 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 in, consequence, and in consequence an important role to play in terms of values, in terms of interaction between population, etc., etc. Many Latin Americans throughout the history have decided to go to Europe to study. Uh, to spend some, some years of their life. The cultural exchange between the countries are, between the regions are very important. And the Chinese are doing the same. They are promoting academic programs. Latin America's studies in China, for example, has increased in a quite significant, in, significant way. I read a paper wrote by my colleague, Darvis Nolte, couple of years ago, in which he shows that in 2000, there were eight, eight Latin American centers in China. And in 2020, there are now 80 Latin American study center in China. So the cultural exchange, the proliferation of Confucio Institute throughout the region, and even there is a media projection, the uh, Chinese news agency Xinhua is in many capitals in Latin America, in Buenos Aires, in Mexico City, in Rio de Janeiro, in Caracas, etc. And there is also a more personal relation between Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders with the Latin American leaders. And at this point, there is no difference between right or left. President like Piñera or, for example, Bukele in Ecuador and in El Salvador has visited China. It has, has spread, has spread many times that China is 
a new ally, for example, in the in the case of, 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 of El Salvador, to promote the changes Bukele, Bukele is trying to, to do in, in, in that country. So once again, China is, is an actor in the region. Next, please. <clears throat> what would be the impact of this rising of China? What is the impact for the youth specifically? And I think two aspects has to be considered here. One is one theoretical, most related to us, the scholars who try to understand the theorization of regional integration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The EU was a model of regional integration for many Latin American countries. Many Latin American countries have tried to build and to construct regional blocks based on the European experience. In aspect of supranationality, the creation of parliaments, but also in aspect of the promotion of democracy, the famous democratic clauses. And in my view, when the United States promoted NAFTA in, in, in the 1990s, they created an alternative model of integration that implies a competition for the EU, in the sense that in NAFTA, the idea of supranationality doesn't exist, for example. And that's very well, that's very well welcome in Latin America, uh, uh, in which sovereignty is also very strong. And for example, the Pacific Alliance is more similar to NAFTA that to the European Union. That was a fair attack to the European model. But the Chinese strategy is implying a new attack, a new attack in, in which regional integration uh, must be just a, and especially interregionally, interregionalism has to be just an economic process, just trade, investment, and forget about values, and forget about democracy. And forget about human rights, because these are not, I would say, characteristic of the Chinese political system. So if the Chinese is not a democracy, and if China is not the example of respect of human rights and political alternation, etc., uh, etc., et why China has to promote those values? And here you have a contrast with the European Union. Europe, the, the relation the of the European Union with the Latin American countries, this is the region I, I know and in which I have made my research, is, is trade. It's real quality. That's true. I, I, I know I'm idealistic. There are a, a strong economic interests in, in, in that relation, but also, it has to be fair in that, it's based on values, on shared values between values that are the result of the interaction Latin America has historically had with Europe, especially we say with Spain and Portugal, but with the continent also in general, with France, with Italy, in terms of immigration, with the UK, when the UK was part of the EU, in terms of uh, economic uh, inter interlinks of economic relations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the EU is, is attacking a model. This is the third point. And the, the second point, is related to the way as the agreement, the association agreement, the Chinese would not describe that as association agreement, but as the trade agreements are, are, are promoted by China. China just one, I, I repeat, in the EU, the strategic agreement implies three factors. Trade, political cooperation, democracy in particular, and cooperation for development. For China, it's just free trade because in the agreement, there is no cooperation. Cooperation is made or is promoted on other basis, bilateral basis, and there is no concern about, about democracy and about um, uh, human rights. This is important because in, unfortunately in Latin America, unfortunately I'm not very happy on that, we are watching a return of authoritarianism, both from the left and from the right. There's no problem of left or right. You go, uh, Nicolas Maduro or Daniel Ortega supposedly are left-wing government, 
and democracy is, I, 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 we are always not existing in, 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 in those countries. And you see the setback of democracy in Brazil during the Bolsonaro government, for example. So for these authoritarian governments in Latin America, this new strategy of trade without conditions and democracy is very good news. Very, very good news. To finish closely, because I think my time is over. Uh, 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 next, please, and I will be very rapid. What we, how did you have to deal with this? And I see there are two, and a very brief try to finish in a minute, with what I call the optimistic view, and I call a more realistic view. The optimistic view is okay, it's true. Uh, Latin America is not a priority for the European Union. It's not one of the prioritarian regions, but it's not either for China. So as the Latin America is not a priority for China, and it's not a priority for the EU, China and the EU can have better condition to defend their mutual interests, and maybe they can find a middle ground there in the region. My optimistic view. I don't think international politics were like that. One a second view coming from some European experts say, but they say the Latin American is also concerned about the Chinese increase in presence in Latin America because uh, it may be implying a new kind of hegemony. So they need both Europe and both the EU and the United States to balance the, this increase in Chinese uh, presence in the region. A third argument, optimistic argument, is many European scholars said, okay, China is present, but the Latin Americans would realize that the trade with China would imply a new central peripheral, to use this traditional concept, central peripheral trade, uh, Latin American selling commodities in the EU manufacture. So that would lead to deindustrialization and increasing dependence on commodities. And there is a lot of truth in this argument. And the final argument is that values matter. And that for many Latin American countries, uh, the, the inter and interregional interregional relation could not be based only on um, trade and investment, but um, political, cultural, and historical values, and this relation exists with you, traditionally. Mm -hmm. The next one, and I finish with it. But the other, more, I would say, I, don't, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but maybe realist, I don't know, that, that depends on your, on your view of how international policy works, is that if the process of uh, consolidation of the Chinese in Latin America occurs, the Latin American economies will be increasingly tied to China. And even will have potentially a political implication because the Chinese communities, there are a lot of Chinese migration in many Latin American countries from China, from Mexico to Chile. You see uh, important Chinese migration in all the, in all the continent. And the corporations, Huawei, for example, to say one, could be more intensely participating in local politics and influences, influencing and consequencing governments. And for many Latin American countries, and for many Latin American leaders now, business since 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 that business are more important than values. This is the other vision. For one, in the optimistic view, values matter. In the pessimistic view, okay, we share some values with Europe, but business are more important than that. If it happens, if this pessimistic scenario happens, the EU could be increasingly replaced by China. The capacity of the United States to resist the Chinese presence in Latin America is stronger, and it's fine. Why? Because in Central America, and Mexico and in the Caribbean, there are interconnection, a productive interconnection with the uh, um, US economy. That is not the case of the European Union. Uh, but 
these are just a scenario. We have to see what's going to happen in the next decade, but this is it's a process in progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we can now move to the Q&A section. Um, let me check if there are any questions here. So, I'm afraid I can't see any, but um, I have a question myself. Maybe we can start with that Andrea. one. Can you see the questions? Yeah, I can see a question of Andres Sanchez in the chat. I think it's in the chat. Yeah, but okay, now here. Okay, good. Thank you. So, um, yes, for starters. So, President Maduro criticized the renewal of European Union sanctions against Venezuela. On the other hand, the United States reduced its sanctions against the country. How do relations with Venezuela affect European Union policy in Latin America? We can take that one and then we can go with Angel's question. All right. Well, okay. It, very, very interesting point. And I, I, I don't want to be strong in this assertion I'm going to say. But I think the European Union has to update his policy in Latin America. The European Union need more more pragmatism in dealing with Latin America, because both the United States and China um, happen to be quite pragmatic, quite quite pragmatic, very real politic in both cases. And I I say that because certainly the example of Venezuela is very good explain uh, this argument. Uh, the United States, especially after the, the, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, established informal talks, conversations with President Maduro. That happened last November. Um, a new Mediation, Norwegian mediation happened in Mexico City. Mexico, Mexico also had to the mediation. And the language, the narrative of the State Department concerning, of, concerning Venezuela or vis a vis Venezuela uh, was modified, was softened, if you want to. Because the priority for the United States is that Venezuela provide more oil in a context in which oil became became become once again a strategic um, good because of the crisis in Ukraine. You know there are elections. There will be elections in Venezuela next year, and the opposition choose Maria Corina Machado in a, an election, an internal election as a candidate, and not surprised to me because the Venezuelan government has done that before, the Supreme Court in Venezuela, controlled by Maduro, decide that those, those internal elections were illegal. Okay? So Maria, Maria Corina will be probably, won't be probably the, the candidate, and that means that the elections in Venezuela next year will not be once again free. And it's in, in this context that the international community is asking for the renovation of democracy. And when the free election has attack, especially the decision of the opposition to promote an internal election, the United States decides to reduce the sanctions. I think the message is quite clear. Their politics is more important. And, and there is a fact. I'm not very happy about that. The fact is that Maduro has been able to consolidate his sense and power. Even Latin American country that has uh, broken relations, Argentina, Macri era, Mexico during 
no relation because Mexico, the policy and not intervention don't let to break in relation, but there was a distance between Mexico and Venezuela, Bolsonaro also. Now, with the new left wing, way in Latin America, Duro, Maduro is, if not that criticized, there is some kind of, okay, who has said that he is the president of, 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 of Venezuela, and there was a strong criticism to the nomination of Juan Guaido as president, interim president of Venezuela. So I wouldn't say that in Latin America, there is a strong support to Maduro government, but he see with more, in a more sympathetic view. And in this case, once again, the European Union uh, uh, maintain its policies and sanctions and considering uh, Maduro as a problem for the region, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My opinion is that the Latin American region is watching the crisis in Venezuela in a quite different way uh, to the European uh, way, uh, to, the, to the way as the European is, is watching, is observing this crisis. And I don't know it is going to affect uh, in a dramatic way the relations between Latin America and European Union, but there is a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem that the EU has to deal with. How to finally has a position, especially, I say especially because you see the United States is changing. It's more pragmatic, it's more flexible in the, okay, in institutional terms, the EU, the US Department said, yes, we support democracy in Venezuela. We support Maria Corina Machado in his uh, desire to be president. The, we need free elections in Venezuela say, and all that, but they reduce sanctions. And that is what, what Euro is not doing, actually. Uh, well, this is my reflection. It's a very interesting, a very inter interesting question. Andrea. Yes, thank you. So the next question is about Ukraine and Ukraine invasion by Russia. How has this affected the EU, European Union's standing in Latin America? Well, I think the best response to this question was the recent summit, select summits in Brussels. Because one of the points in which there was no consensus was a point in what's quite bitter, the negotiation or the discussion of what detained the issue of the crime, the point of the crime. That the European Union is at the bottom, has the or promote democratic values, and certainly Russia is not a democracy. That is pretty clear to me. And certainly Russia invades an independent and sovereign country, Ukraine. But once again, her politics and realism matter. The Russians they, they consider that this attempt to incorporate Ukraine in NATO was unacceptable and all that. But European has a position. We strongly reject the intervention. And European has think that Latin America is a partner also in terms of values, that democracy is important, that the principle of non-intervention has been promoted for many Latin American countries during centuries, I would say, expected that the Latin American countries were hand in hand with European rejecting the invasion and approving sanctions and uh, mm even sending military cooperation. And that didn't happen. That didn't happen because certainly most of the Latin American country has rejected the invasion, has criticized, has condemned the invasion. But for example, I know the case here in Mexico where I live, when President Obrador was asked for President Zelensky to send weapons to, to, to Ukraine, the, the answer was not First, because Mexico promote peace, and secondly, because Mexico had the principle of intervention in the domestic affairs as a constitutional principle, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, they condemn by then trying with Russia and as diplomatic relations with Russia, and there is not sanctions against Russia. And I think many people in scholars and politicians, political leaders, see that this idea of EU that because supposedly we have some values, shared values, we have to follow Europe in his politics of, in, in his position 
vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is is not in position. It's not under understanding that Latin America ha can have autonomous views concerning international political issues. Autonomy, remember, is an important issue for many like, Latin American countries. There is even literature in inter international relations in Latin America about this idea of the autonomy. So the, 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 the Ukraine crisis can affect the EU standing in Latin America. Potentially, yes. Potentially, yes, because some Latin American countries don't accept the, the, the claims of some European political leaders or scholars that Latin America has no opposition vis-a-vis -vis or regarding the crisis in Ukraine. In, in Ukraine. Yes, Latin America has a position. That is the, the response of the, of the leaders, of the Latin American leaders. Similar response I saw in Fernandez, in Lula, in, in Petro, in, in Lopez Obrador, with some nuances, but in general, the response is the same. Yes, we reject, we condemn the, inv the, inv the invasion, but that is, that is happening very far from Latin America. So we have not to be involved neither in sanctions nor in military assistance to none of the parts, both Russians or the Ukrainians. <clears throat> And muted. So, uh, thank you, Jose. The, sec the third question is, what should be the priority areas or sectors of cooperation between Latin America and the European Union beyond traditional development cooperation? And where would mutual needs match better? Well, I think, the I think development cooperation still matters. This is the first point of my answer, because there are many countries in Latin America in, in problems in terms of social in, in terms of economic development. Uh, 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 this, this is the first point. Economic development is still an issue for many Latin American countries. And I think this is one of the reasons of the rising of China. China is investing in a quite significant way in, in, in development cooperation without condition, conditions because supposedly South South cooperation is based on other premises that OECD cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. This is another issue to discuss. But where other, and here I express expressing my points of view, maybe some of you probably does not agree with me, but I think uh, one point that is still crucial for Latin America is in the field of politics, that is in democracy. Democracy in Latin America is also at stake. I say the EU has to update his uh, strategy towards Latin America, including his strategy to promote democracy. But one thing is upgrade, improve, and one another thing is abandon. Uh, we need the European cooperation to uh, help in dealing with the new menace, the new threat you see in, in countries like Venezuela, for example, or unfortunately, even in Argentina, when you see a uh, extreme right populist leader close to, or with a lot of possibilities of, of becoming president, um, highlighting of even um, trying to modify the narrative and the consensus that Argentina has achieved in in around the dictatorship and the violation of human rights of that dictatorship, etc. But Argentina is just one case that happened in Brazil with Bolsonaro and potentially could happen in Chile with gas. And once again, if not a question of right and left, that is happening in Nicaragua with Ortega. There is no democracy in, in Nicaragua okay, or, or in Venezuela. So I think this is a point in which Latin American societies in some part our leadership uh, still need the cooperation of the European Union. I, I, that is my point of view. Another point certainly is climate change. Climate change is very important because one of the main, let's say, um, issues on, on, on climate change is the protection of the Amazonic forest that is located, as you well know, 
in our South American continent. So these these are issues in in which the the countries the the regions can still improve, uh, in, in, in still cooperate. I think. Thank you. So the. Last question we have here is whether you believe that with environmental conditions that the EU has imposed on Mercosur uh, for the negotiations of the uh, Free Trade Association Agreement regarding EU deforestation regulation, which of course China does not have, whether this will negatively impact EU Latin American relations and whether if Lula's government uh, for being closer normatively in values with the EU than Bolsonaro will pursue a rapprochement with the EU and in this way um, strengthen EU-Latin American relations. So those are two questions, I think. <laughs> yeah, two questions. No, certainly, I, I, I mean, once again, the, 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 the Latin American scenario has, has changed because of, of the presence of China. I had said I really committed to the climate change issue. It's not a minor change, it's not a minor issue. Uh, and But the perception in Latin American uh, countries, especially in Mercosur countries, especially for, for example in Lula government, is that these new environmental conditions imposed uh, to the ratification of the interregional agreement between the EU and Mercosur is more political bias that environmentally committed. I mean, political factors are more important than the real concern. That is the perception. I'm not saying that it's true or not, but it's the perception you see in Latin America. The EU is using environment as a new conditionality to subscribe the agreement when the real fact is that the some agriculture sectors in France or in Denmark uh, think that the agreement with the Mercosur countries is a threat because Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil are highly comp high competitive uh, countries in producing some products like meat, cheese, etc. I don't know, there's a point for discussion, but the region has changed because now you have China. And China is saying to Mercosur and is saying to Argentina and is saying to Brazil, you want a free trade agreement? Okay, let's go, let's do it. But environment, not my problem. It's not my problem, it's not a Chinese problem to, co to condition a free trade agreement to environmental re regulation. So you see two different perspectives on how to to build an interregional relation. With a, a, a two perceptions will be will prevail? I don't know. But in politics, at the end of the day, many states are rational actors and the incentives and the idea of maximizing benefits are very uh, in the logic of the international politics system. This is the first question. And the second question, why do you believe in Lula government for being close and normative values with the EU than Bolsonaro? I, in principle, yes. I, 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 I would say yes. Uh, in terms of, for example, we can we cannot deny the democratic commitment of, of Lula. But there is also, there is also uh, in Lula, in the NDPT government, the Partido de los Trabajadores, the working party, uh, the traditional view in the left wing in Latin America that the international system built after the Second World War, and both in political terms, the multilateral system, the United Nations, etc., and the economic field, the International Monetary Fund, the board man, etc., is very unfair. And that has to be modified. Uh, and this is the reason why the Brazil is with China, with India, with Russia, with South Africa, with the BRICS, trying to create new institutions. Uh, the Bank of BRICS, for example. So probably the values, in terms of values, there are common interests. 
but the strategy of Lula not necessarily implies a, uh, I would say, unique, special relation with the EU. But because for Lula, the construction of the new international economic order and political order, the BRICS now expanded, you know, with Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Egypt, etc., is one mechanism. And in this point, not necessarily will be uh, consensus with the EU. Difference could appear, potentially. Okay, thank you, Jose. I think that was the last question we had. And in fact, we are already running out of time. So before we conclude, um, just a final reminder. Um, so if you want to know more about the current issues of European external actions, there will be more engaged high level lectures and webinars in the very near future. You can check this information and also access the recordings of previous lectures on Engage website, that is engage-eu.eu, where you can also subscribe to the project's newsletter. So let me just conclude by thanking Jose for this very interesting lecture and thanking um, all our participants for joining us today. Until the next time, goodbye, see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>